Why do we still ask students to memorize facts when we have these things? When I first started my career in education, I had a very specific goal in mind, to improve the education system in Jordan, where I grew up. That's one of these countries here. I thought I would do this by solving a very specific problem, school's reliance on rote memorization. At the time, I thought this was the solution to all of our educational woes. We just needed to focus less on memorizing facts and content and more on higher order skills, things like problem solving and critical thinking. This seemed especially pertinent today when most of the facts and content you could possibly need are all just a few clicks away. But as you may have guessed, it wasn't that simple, especially when I found out that this critique is fairly common around the world. I mean, as part of my own work alone, I've heard this complaint from clients in China, Jordan, the US, the UK, and Pakistan separately. What's more, I found out that this critique wasn't exactly new either. Check out this quote from the 19th century. Nothing in education is so astonishing as the amount of ignorance it accumulates in the form of inert facts. And this isn't the only quote like it from that time. So what's going on here? Why do we still complain about this problem even though we seem to have figured it out over a hundred years ago? Is it that the education systems are so entrenched in the ways they currently operate that we just can't seem to escape it? Or is it that just teachers and students are lazy and slip into this comfortable routine? Or have we actually misunderstood what this problem really is? To answer this question, we're going to have to dive into the science of memory and learning, solve some puzzles together, and probably be interrupted by my cat. Let's be clear here on what the argument actually is. We don't know what the world is going to look like, whether 20 or even 10 years in the future. And this is true at both a global and an individual level. I mean, if you came to 12 year old me and told me that I'd be making YouTube videos, okay, I'd probably believe you, but that's not the point. But there's no actual way of preparing students for what's to come in their lives. And so instead, what we need to do is equip them with a set of transferable skills that they can apply in different scenarios. Skills like problem solving, creativity, critical thinking, collaboration. Now, I recognize these aren't the same thing, but for the purposes of this video, I am going to be referring to them interchangeably. Despite the fact that we agree on this, most of our curricula are still very content driven. Children are given a set of textbooks with the assumption that this is what they're going to need when they grow up. But the fact of the matter is that we don't actually know what they'll need when they grow up. When I started digging into this, I learned why it is that education systems seem to veer towards a more content driven approach to learning. And while doing so, I also unearthed some fascinating findings and misconceptions we have about memory, thinking, content, and the relationship between those three. Starting with, these transferable skills might not actually be that transferable. At first glance, critical thinking and problem solving should be skills that can be taught and applied irrespective of content, right? There are higher order skills that transcend factual knowledge and content, and we should be able to apply them interchangeably between contexts, right? Well, yes, but also no. To learn why, Let's take a look at this puzzle. Each of the following cards has a letter on one side and a digit on the other, but there is a rule. If there is a vowel on one side, then there must be an even number on the other side. Your job is to verify whether this rule is met for this set of four cards and to turn over the minimum number of cards necessary to do so. So if a card has a letter U, you would need to make sure that the other side is an even number. So in this case, what is the minimum number of cards that you need to turn over? I'll give you a second. The answer is two. You would have to check the first and the fourth cards. Now, let's try that again with a different version of the same problem. In version two, you run a shop that rents out bicycles and cars. In order to rent out a car, the customer must be over 18 years old, but anyone can rent out a bicycle. On these cards, one side is the customer's age and the other is what they're looking to rent. How many of these cards do you need to flip over to make sure that you're not renting out a car to a minor? The answer again is two. And if you're like most people, then you probably solved that second puzzle a lot faster than you did the first. But why is that? This is despite the fact that both puzzles are, in essence, the same. But why is it that the second one was so much easier to solve? We typically think of problem solving and critical thinking a 
bit like we think of a calculator. You input the numbers and the calculator churns out an answer. Similarly, we input data into our brains and your critical thinking does its work, and then it outputs some kind of answer. Implicit in this model is that this would be true regardless of the type of information that is inputted. But as the card example shows us, what you're thinking about matters just as much as how you're thinking about it. One of the reasons for this has to do with our long-term and short-term memories. Let's take a look at those puzzles again. In the first version, you were asked to remember quite a few facts relating to the puzzle, like the fact that a vowel must have an even number on the other side. And there are other facts that you may not have been explicitly told, but you managed to piece together and therefore had to commit to memory afterwards. Like the fact that a consonant can have both an even or an odd number on the other side. You had to keep all these facts aligned in your short-term memory. And your short-term memory is actually pretty limited. Limited to about seven items, give or take. In the second version, however, you already had a lot of that information stored in your memory. You knew, for example, that children should not be allowed to drive, but that anyone can ride a bicycle. Instead of having to keep all of that information sorted, all you had to do was refer to it, which freed up your mind to solve this puzzle, relying on those shortcuts from your memory. Which brings me to another secret about critical thinking. We don't actually do that much of it. In extreme cases like myself, I just coast by on the script telling me what to say, how to think, what to do, when to eat, and how to live my life. In most people's cases, thinking is still a pretty taxing process. This is why we actually rely on shortcuts to get through most of our lives. These shortcuts are stored in our memory and are built based on our understanding of how the world works. Critical thinking and problem solving are to some extent our last line of defense when trying to solve problems. Our first is to just ask whether or not we've faced a similar problem before. Sometimes what we actually think of as thinking is actually just remembering in disguise. And we see this everywhere, even a task as simple as reading. When you were learning how to read, you actually had to think very hard about how to decode the letters and pronounce the words. As you practice more and more, you actually committed these letters, words, and linguistic patterns to your memory. I think an even better way to illustrate this point is to look at master chess players. We normally think of master chess players as the epitome of reasoning and strategic thinking. We think of the calculating mastermind that plans 10 steps ahead of their opponent. And while they obviously do enact some thinking during their games, in reality, they actually have hundreds or even thousands of board positions memorized. And as such, they can react almost instinctively to some of the moves that their opponents make. What makes us think this? Well, blitz tournaments. Chess games that are only a few minutes long as opposed to an hour or more. During these games, players don't really have much time to engage in deep reasoning or planning. They have to instead react almost instinctively to their opponent's moves. Even in these games, however, chess masters still usually end up on top, implying that it's not just their reasoning that helps them stand out, but their memory as well. And we see this in other professions as well. Doctors have to memorize hundreds of diseases, symptoms, and their accompanying treatments. Uh, lawyers have to memorize hundreds of cases before they graduate. This doesn't necessarily mean that a lawyer couldn't have come up with a similar legal argument without having memorized the case, but having done so significantly reduces the time and mental effort that they use to do so. And it allows them to be a lot more creative with where they invest their mental energy. And so we rely on these shortcuts, but where do we get these shortcuts from? Okay, so that kind of made sense. We need facts and content to build these transferable skills. But a lot of the facts and content that I remember learning in school aren't really tied to any of these skills. There are a lot of useless facts that are floating around in my head that I'm fairly certain I've never used in my entire life. Why do I need to learn useless facts like the mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell if I'm never going to use it and it's something that I could pretty easily look up? Yes, that is in fact a useless fact. And as a matter of fact, all facts are useless in isolation. For example, knowing that my favorite color is green isn't really something that'll add much to your life. However, knowing that my favorite color is green, I'm afraid of penguins, and I know the entire script of Hannibal off by heart, makes you understand that I'm someone that you should probably avoid if you saw in public. See, facts aren't meant to be learned in isolation. They're supposed to be learned in relation to our facts, and based on these relationships, patterns are supposed to form. And these patterns form the basis of your understanding of how the world works. Knowing that World War I happened in 1914 isn't very helpful. 
But knowing that millions died, it was followed by the Treaty of Versailles, and it still led to a Second World War, paints a picture of how nations work and how the world today came to be. It helps you better understand what's happening in the Ukraine today, or maybe even that peace is something that we need to work towards and not something that we should take for granted. The process is actually captured very nicely by none other than Mr. Beast himself. You know, you, you can never learn enough. And like, there could be just one simple thing you learn through watching like an educational video that just like changes how you think and like allows you to just make better decisions for the rest of your life. But when is memorization actually a problem? Well, I know I just implied that memorization and While I know I just made the argument that memorization and facts are an important and critical part of a student's learning journey, the sheer ubiquity of the arguments against it seem to imply that there is something wrong with it. But what is it? The argument that's often made against memorization is often made about a very specific type of memorization, rote memorization. Rote memorization is described by Daniel Winningham as memorization without meaning. Meaning helps with memory and consequently, with learning. For example, children, as their learning language, are able to memorize thousands of words in a matter of months. One of the explanations of this incredible feat is that as the child's vocabulary is growing, so is their understanding of the world. So if the child just learnt the word lion, for example, it may take them a while to comprehend the concept. It is a cat, it lives in the jungle, it has sharp claws, and it eats meat. But once they've understood the word for lion, it's a lot easier for them to understand the word for tiger. It's similar to a lion, but with stripes. One could argue that the art of teaching is all about making knowledge meaningful to students. But what if memorization is devoid of meaning? This is what we call rote memorization, and it can be a symptom of a bad education system. If students don't understand the implications of what they're learning, not only does that defeat the purpose, but it also makes learning more difficult. And there are students, teachers, and education systems that, whether they mean to or not, tend to promote these types of learning. A child might memorize the shape of a word by hearing it from others without learning how to decode or read. A teacher might ask a student to memorize the six reasons for World War II in a textbook because that's ultimately what they're going to be tested on. And they might feel that distracting them with nuance might actually be a disservice to that student. The result of rote memorization is often short-term gain, either for an exam or to avoid embarrassment in class at the expense of longer-term learning. Is there, however, a time where rote memorization is actually useful? Yes, yes, there is, performing the script. But more importantly, sometimes a base level of knowledge is needed in order to engage in more meaningful learning later on. For example, if the teacher wanted to explain how the human cell works, that might be pretty difficult if the students didn't know the names of all the different components. For this reason, students might resort to rote memorization to build the basis and the groundwork for more meaningful discussions later on. In cases like these, students and teachers might resort to strategies to associate these facts with some kind of meaning even if it is superficial. These might include strategies such as mnemonic devices like songs or acronyms to make it easier to remember later on. At different points in my school and career, history was both my favorite and least favorite subject. Thinking back to when it was my favorite, I remember learning a lot about how history relates to my day-to-day -day life, how our countries and cultures, our families, are a result of historic events, and how to truly understand ourselves we must first understand our history. When thinking back to when history was my least favorite subject, I don't actually remember that much. What I do remember is the stress and the time I spent memorizing chunks of verbatim from the textbook because that's what was expected of me and that's what I would be tested on. Ironically, I think I memorized more facts when the sole focus of the class wasn't rote memorization. The difference between the two classes the teacher, and not just the teacher's skill, but also whether or not they were put in an environment that allowed them to explore this type of learning. Did they have the permission to explore alternative teaching methods, or would they ultimately be penalized for not preparing you for that test that relies on rote memorization? The question isn't whether or not students should or shouldn't be memorizing facts. The question is how and when, and why is it that rote memorization sometimes replaces deep and meaningful learning. 
In this video, we've only just scratched the surface of the science behind memory, learning, and the relationship between content and thinking. And you can learn a lot more about it from these books here, the link to which can be found in the description. But what happens when memory fails? Forgetting plays as critical a role in learning as, well, remembering does. To learn what that role is and how forgetting can actually boost your learning, take a look at this video here. This was Abdullah from Eden, and I hope you have a good day.